Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me. I always enjoy uh, talking to audiences like this, the people that are on the front lines dealing with these problems every single day. Um, I've also uh, been able to look through the agenda that you've had on this course so far. It seems like you have touched on a great many number of important subjects. Uh, but I think it's fitting that this subject uh, comes last in this section because it has the potential to tie everything together. I'm going to talk about three things, and I'm going to echo some of the comments that my colleague uh, David said. I'm going to talk a little bit about the nature of the problem of international organized crime. I'll talk a little bit about the recent trends in convergence, as uh, David talked about. And then I'm going to talk about uh, very practically what to do about these problems, with a particular emphasis of the military role, given so many of your military backgrounds and given the fact that we're at the National Defense University here. Um, of course, uh, crime is always a problem for every country in the world. Um, that's not what we're here to talk about. What we're here to talk about is crime when it becomes a national security problem. When, it, by scale or by type, it has become such a difficult issue that it is beyond the mere capabilities of law enforcement and the judicial sector alone to deal with these issues. And the threats that it poses to the country in question, and its neighbors and its friends around the world, like the United States, become very serious. Let's talk about what some of those uh, how, how we see that national security problem um, uh, be, in our, in, uh, come into our faces and, and uh, become evident. Um, there's direct and there's indirect ways. On the direct ways, it's when that crime uh, denies the government um, the, its, its status as the sole legitimate user of force in the country when criminal organizations are, are, uh, have their own uh, armies, have their own ability to use force, and are seen by many in the population as legitimate. Um, when it denies the government access to areas inside its own country and control over its own borders, then it's a national security threat. When international organized crime trends cooperate with other direct threats to national security, like terrorist groups, then international organized crime is a national security threat. Those are direct ways. There are also indirect ways. Uh, when it gets to the scale that it fundamentally corrupts legal systems and governments, when it encourages a, a, a deep culture of bribery and self-dealing, it becomes a national security threat. When it is such a, such a scale that it prevents uh, reasonable economic development, then it's a national security threat. And when it directly hinders foreign direct investment, uh, it's a national security threat. So those are direct and indirect ways that crime becomes a national security threat. And it becomes a threat to other nations if it affects the national security interests of those nations. And again, it can do so directly by criminal organizations working with terrorist groups that threaten other nations, including the United States. And then we get very uh, interested. And it also can do so indirectly by destabilizing a region that's of national security importance to a number of countries around the world, indeed, the global community. This kind of uh, national security strip can also be thought of as both top down and sort of bottom up. Uh, sometimes, organized, uh, the threat that is posed by international organized crime is top down. It's, it's a the culture of criminality is led and modeled by those in power. So we all we all uh, know story no no instances where this where this is the case. And sometimes it's bottom up, where there are cultural longstanding cultural norms or subcultural norms that are usually driven by deep socioeconomic and political incentives and realities that contribute to the flourishing of international organized crime. These kinds of threats. National security threats from international organized crime are also internally uh, driven and externally driven. What I mean by that is sometimes the demand for the crimes in question are from the country itself and its own, and its own population. 
But sometimes it's externally driven. Sometimes the demand for the entities, for the things being smuggled for the, uh, is, from, is from abroad. And many countries in Africa, unfortunately, suffer from both. What I've observed is that it's, it is sometimes uh, challenging politically. It's politically difficult for countries to aggressively deal with the externally driven organized crime because they think that it's someone else's fault. And to a great degree, it is. You know, the, the, the people in, uh, in, in uh, Western Europe get a taste for cocaine. That's not the fault of people in West Africa. But West African countries suffer because transnational organized crime groups move the cocaine through West Africa. If people in East Asia want to have ivory, uh, it's not the fault of the people in East Africa, but they suffer for the, for the uh, smuggling that goes out. And sometimes what I've observed is some political leaders, because it's externally driven, they, um, they may not be as, uh, as directly focused on it as the internally driven efforts. Um, so let's talk a little bit uh, about the second topic, about convergence, which David has discussed at length. But I do want to uh, mention just a few things that I think um, add to his extremely good um, discussion. Um, the convergence, the, move, the, the, the combination of criminal groups, drug trafficking groups, terrorist organizations, all of these actors coming together, at one level is not a new thing. As I like to point out to people, uh, at, the, at the turn of the last century, <laughs> a little, little after that, um, the, uh, there was a stagecoach robbery in Georgia, a criminal action where a bank uh, a, a, a stagecoach that held a lot of money that belonged, gold that belonged to a bank was robbed. The people that were behind that robbery were named Lenin and Stalin. <laughs> and they used that money to help push, to help fund their Bolshevik uh, uh, movement. That's criminality, so, you know, uh, funding an insurgency uh, group. So this stuff has been around for a long time, this convergence. But at the same point, things have changed. Um, and no place is that more obvious than in terrorism. I've been working on terrorism for a long time, um, and I remember when, in the, at least from the United States perspective, uh, whenever we were talking about terrorism, we were almost always just talking about state-sponsored terrorism. So when it came to questions about how the terrorist groups got money and how they moved their uh, uh, their weapons and their people, it was all the same. A state sponsored it. It was very easy. And then Al-Qaeda, uh, led by Osama bin Laden, um, really promulgated a new model, which said we don't need a state at all. We will instead raise money from, uh, from, from people who support our cause all around the world. And we can be self-supporting, and we can use our own networks to move things. And now that model is, uh, is also going by the wayside, and you have the terrorist groups that more and more often uh, don't even need winning support from abroad or elsewhere. They, they get their own money, their own uh, uh, logistics center, their own facilitation networks in the land that they operate in. They operate criminal organizations. They cooperate with criminal organizations. They smuggle through normal uh, routes. Um, they uh, tax the people that they, um, that, they, uh, 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 that they have under their population. And that's a very different kind of terrorist organization. And so, the, and so therefore, the national security threat that we all face from criminal uh, networks and activities has, has gone up because of this worldwide trend. So again, not to repeat too much of what David said, but if you look at the kind of crime that, that is connected in this kind of convergence, you see uh, uh, counterfeiting, of course, but drugs are, are still the largest purely criminal effort where not only the movement of it, but the actual uh, uh, product itself is illegal um, in the world. All kinds of smuggling of commodities listed and illicit of people. Kidnapping for ransom is a, is a huge, huge problem. And all of this builds off of usually long established patterns of movement and control of roots. They don't recreate the wheel, they build on what is already there. 
Again, they tax territory, they siphon off revenues and oil and power. Um, you know, there, there was, in the recent campaign, just as an aside, in uh, the U.S. air campaign in Syria, there were a lot of, uh, I was in a meeting once, there were a lot of mi very smart military minds who were talking about where the Islamic State was going to go next. This is early on as in, their, in their movement after they had taken Mosul. And they couldn't figure out, are they going to go here or are they going to go here? And then one person in the back said, I know exactly where they're going to go. They're going to go right there. And he looked at him, and this was a civilian. This was not anyone in military uniform. They said, well, how do you know that? And it's like, oh, because I'm an energy power expert, and I know exactly if they took this effort, then they need to take this in order to make the transition lines to go over here to power what they're doing because they're taking money off of the power lines. And that person with no military expertise was exactly right because their military objectives were being driven by the money that they wanted to get by siphoning off the power. And all of this is working on a global basis. Um, how, many, how many of you, uh, this was probably about five or six years ago, remember the story of uh, a bank in Lebanon, Lebanese Canadian Bank? Does that ring any bells for anybody? The, just, just very briefly, what we saw here was drugs that were coming out of South America, cocaine, moving through West Africa on their way to Spain and England, largely, corrupting and, and causing big problems for West Africa, pr pr producing a lot of money. At the same time, there was a criminal network coming from the United States that was moving stolen cars and some legitimately bought used cars into West Africa. The money from both of those criminal organizations, which were different criminal organizations, were put together and were moved into one bank in Lebanon called Lebanese Canadian Bank. That was not Canadian, by the way. <laughs> I always have to say that for my Canadian friends. <laughs> um, but it was moved into that bank. That bank then laundered the funds and moved them to China where they bought counterfeit goods. The counterfeit goods were then shipped across the Pacific back to South America to be sold to be give, so the proceeds would go back to the drug cartels that started the whole process. That's a global network on every continent. And who owned Lebanese, who, who, uh, uh, who had a lot of power over Lebanese Canadian Bank? The terrorist group Hezbollah, who was taking a, a piece of the money at every step along the way. So you see organized crime groups in South America, in North America, in Africa, in Europe, and in Asia, all cooperating together, all providing, at the end of the day, money for terrorist group that had nothing to do with them ideologically. This is the world that we're in today. Thankfully, that particular uh, mechanism was, was broken up by very good law enforcement and sanctions work and intelligence work, um, but there are other networks like that. So let's talk about, with that example in mind, the last thing I want to talk about is how to combat these, these issues. Well, the, perhaps the most important thing are, is the long-range efforts, the deep institutional efforts, and, and all of those that David talked about. Um, that the United States State Department, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement uh, Bureau uh, funds and manages and oversees are greatly important to, uh, for technical assistance, for institutional improvements, for law enforcement, for the judicial sector, uh, for all of that. Perhaps even more important are efforts on the demand side to make sure that countries that are demanding ivory or demanding cocaine or demanding heroin that ends up harming countries in Africa limit their demand. We should always remember that. But then there are the near-term, more operational efforts that need to be done against these entities. And let, me, and let me talk about what we have learned in the United States just really in the last 15 years or so um, about how to go about uh, doing that. Um, first and foremost, when going against a particular criminal terrorist nexus that we think rises to the level of a national security threat, 
before you do anything, you really need to start with the theory of the case. What are we looking at here? And frankly, so many times I've seen people don't. They want to jump right into the crime. But you have to understand what is the network that we're talking about? What are they trying to do? What is the story that I just described for Lebanese Canadian Bank? And try to understand that. I'll give you again one, one example of that from my own personal experience. I remember in 1990s, I was working at the White House and we were hearing a lot about Osama bin Laden and he had just left Sudan and would, was in Afghanistan now and, and he seemed to be wanting to blow things up in the United States and kill Americans. He had already, already done, done that a couple of times. And we asked, how does Osama bin Laden get his money to do this? What is it? And the answer that we got, the theory of the case at the time, was sort of, well, that's an odd question because he's a really rich person and this doesn't take a lot of money. That was entirely wrong, as I said before. What he was, was he was sitting on top of a global money-making network, a money-flowing network. But that's what we thought. We had the wrong theory of the case in the mid-90s about bin Laden. We didn't understand what we were dealing with. And the first thing you have to do is you have to have that understanding. And in order to have that understanding, it is absolutely essential that you need to have local knowledge. That's where you have that local knowledge. Your colleagues have that local knowledge. You know what's happening in your countries, uh, in, your, in your provinces. Uh, we in the United States largely don't. Um, but you need to start with local knowledge. Uh, that, that local knowledge drives what information you need and then how you go about getting it. After you have come up with the theory of the case of the organization that you're, that you're working in, then it comes down to uh, operational efforts. And the most important thing in this world of convergence that we have found uh, useful for us is to break down the uh, legal and operational uh, structures in place that prevent one bureaucracy from talking to another bureaucracy. Um, that, that prevent law enforcement and intelligence and military to all work together, to prevent different law enforcement organizations to work together, different countries from working together. And by far and away, the best way to do it is to get everybody physically in one place. If people are physically in one place together, it is really hard for them not to share information. And we learned that uh, we were not doing that, for instance, in Iraq when the war, when the war began uh, uh, in 2002. We're not doing it. And, it was a, it was a fit, and we had huge problems. It was only later when we started to look at things holistically and bring everyone together that we started to have some success. Um, you also want to look at the full range of tools that are available. Um, not only tools that belong to the country that is most directly affected where the problem is, but the tools that the partners have. And again, one of the things that the United States can really bring to the table is that some of our laws uh, give the United States an extraterritorial authority to be able to arrest people abroad with the support and cooperation of the host nation, always. So in Colombia, they were having huge problems. And if you ask President Uribe, former President Uribe, he will say the most important thing, that decision that he made was to start cooperating with the United States to allow the United States to extradite and take some criminals off of his hands, which we're happy to do as part of this cooperate, cooperation. And so that's, I'd say, look at all the tools. And then very tactically, you need to map the networks. We need to physically write down, do all those, I'm sure many of you in the military and law enforcement have seen them all, all the spider charts that say who is connected to who and how, so that you can understand what the, exactly who is in the networks, how they communicate with each other, how they move money to each other, who, how they're related to each other. Um, much of this information is not secret. It's known by people locally. Some of it is, and then you need to use intelligence for it, but most of it is not. Technology, it can be useful, but sometimes is wasteful. People think of it as a panacea. It's really much more intellect and, and, and working down. And so the last thing I just want to say is, what's the role for the military in all of this? In most cases, when we're not involved in, in war, uh, the militaries are support mechanisms. That's the military's role, is to support the civilian uh, authorities. And how do we do this? Uh, most importantly is the analytics that militaries tend to be very, very good at. 
bringing the culture of multilateral communication support, which often is stronger from a military to military perspective than it might be from a law enforcement to law enforcement perspective, or even an intelligence to intelligence perspective. And then sometimes, very, very rarely, but in some places more and more often than not, the military is actually part of the, uh, of the operational action against the, against the criminal um, organization in place. But in all cases, the military works best when it's part of a holistic, whole of government, whole of nation approach with law enforcement to judicial sector, financial regulations, sanctions, anti-corruption efforts, and so forth. So thank you very much. I appreciate uh, all of your time, and I look forward to your questions.